It's a time of learning. It's a time of empowerment. It's a time of renewal and refresh. It's a time of insight and impact. We we'll pray that tonight, grant us wisdom that helps us to live victoriously as we study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us to learn from the experience of Joshua and Israel. And as we follow the same path, the victory they enjoy, the conquest they experience. Oh Lord, will we experience the same in Jesus' name? Amen. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. We come to tonight's study. And tonight's study is spanning Joshua chapter 7 and 8. We've already finished Joshua chapter 8, but we want to look at some lessons we learn as we combine chapter 7 and 8 together. Some salient lessons that can help our life. And tonight, we're looking at the message, bouncing back from recent defeat. Israel had experienced defeat in Joshua chapter 7. But we see that they bounced back from that defeat in Joshua chapter 8. How did they bounce back from their recent defeat? And how can we bounce back if we ever experience defeat? That is the message of tonight. Defeat is never pleasant. Defeat always leaves a bad taste in the mouth. However, there is a way to bounce back from defeat. Joshua and Israel, they experienced a great setback at after a mighty and resounding victory at Jericho. They experienced defeat after victory. And that's why we need to be very, very vigilant. When you have a victory, guard it. Don't let it descend into defeat. Because most of the time, as we have victory, we don't guard ourselves. We don't pay a lot of attention. We lose our guards, and the enemy takes advantage. And before you know it, defeat follows victory. So every time you have victory, it's a time to be sober. It's a, rejoice, but be sober. Rejoice, but be vigilant. Rejoice, but know that the enemy is looking for an occasion for slackness to strike. Don't let your victory turn into defeat. However, in the case of Israel, they refused to allow this set, temporary setback at Ai to become a permanent defeat. That's the problem for some people. As long as we live in the world, we will experience setbacks. Sometimes physical setback, sometimes spiritual setback. At other times, for people who are careless and are not vigilant enough, moral setback. Setback one way or the other will occur. But are you going to remain in that setback? Is it going to be a temporary occurrence or is it going to be a permanent feature of your life? It has been said, my enemy rejoice not over me. If I fall, I will rise again. That should be your attitude. That if you experience defeat, you are coming out. You are not going to stay out of, you are not going to stay in that defeat. You are bouncing back from that defeat. And here we saw that Israel refused to make the setback at AI to make it a permanent defeat. They saw it at a temporary setback and they refused to make it a permanent defeat. They considered it a temporary setback. Through fasting and praying, they came out of the cloud. They came out of the defeat into the sunshine of victory and dominion. I pray that this will be your portion in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On the platform tonight, 
maybe in the family you have experienced a temporary setback, you will bounce back in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. it might be, because this is what we are studying tonight, and you need to understand that this is a principle in the scripture. Apart from what we are going to see, we are going to see several examples of how Israel over many generations and used the same principle to come out of defeat every time. And if we will do the same thing in our contemporary times, we will experience the same results. Number one, let's look at failure and savior's chastisement. What are we saying? There are times when we experience failure in life, or experience failure in ministry, or sometimes for some people, in both of them, they experience failure in life and ministry. Fasting could be one of the ways of bouncing back from our failure. Many people, over many generations, they use this as a tool of victory to bounce back from that defeat. Now, let's look at Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7, I read from verse 4. So there went up Tida of the children of the people, about 3,000, about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ahab. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebari, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. They were discouraged. Defeat brings discouragement. They were deflated. Defeat brings deflation. They were dejected. Defeat brings dejection, but don't let it end there. In verse 6, and Joshua rent his clothes. You will see what he did. But why did they experience this defeat? Verse 10, and the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore lies thou thus upon thy face, Israel has been. Israel are sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of their cousin thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own store. Therefore, because of this, therefore, the children of Israel will not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy their cousin from among you. So God told them the reason for their defeat, sin in the camp. And anytime we sin, God will chastise us. You see it in the scriptures. So that's important. There are times when we experience failure in life or ministry, fasting will be our way out. The children of Israel were brimming all over with the recent victory over Jericho. When you read in chapter 6, they were so happy. The Bible says the fame of Joshua went out throughout the whole land. People were celebrating. Look at what we have achieved. We have captured Jericho. Everybody was jubilating. The fame of Joshua was ringing throughout the entire region. They were celebrating. With confidence and faith generated from this victory, they went to confront Ahab, only to be defeated. Do you realize what it is? 
you are very passionate, you are very enthusiastic, you are very happy because you have won, got a victory and you know that the God that has given me this victory is going to give me the next victory, only to suffer defeat. They were deflated. Now what is this? What has happened? They were completely deflated. And that's what happens sometimes. Now, what eventually did they do? The defeat puzzled and devastated Joshua, their leader, who decided to fast and pray in order to know the reason for the defeat and find the way out of the defeat. Joshua didn't face the people that said, you are cowards. I sent you to go and fight. You ran back. Why did they run back? You better seek God to know the reason why a courageous army will melt away like, you know, like ice, like ice cream in the sun, while everybody will run for their life. These were warriors. This is not normal. And Joshua did not face the generals and face the people. You are cowards. How can you behave like this on the mission field? He went to God. He went to pray. He fasted and prayed. Because when we do, we can get to the root of the problem. Because if you don't get to the root of the problem, you say, no, tomorrow we are going back to go and fight here. Everybody, you know, summon up your courage, you will lose again. Because it's not the absence of courage that made them to lose this battle. It was because of sin in the camp and God had abandoned them. You must get to the root of the problem. And sometimes we cannot get to the root of the problem physically, just by arguing and discussing with people, we get to the root of the problem through revelation. Joshua needed to know what this situation. We got a mighty victory over Jericho. Jericho was bigger and stronger than Ai. So how do we win over Jericho and lose over Ai? This is too troubling. What is the problem? And thank God, God told him the problem because he prayed. If we will pray, if we will fast, if we will care enough, God will show us the problem, like He showed Israel. If we are concerned enough and we are honest enough, we want to know why the problem, I mean, we are in, why we are in that problem, God will give the revelation. That's important. So God showed Joshua that their national defeat was as a result of hidden sin in the congregation. God revealed the culprit and gave them the solution to the problem. God did not only tell them the problem, he told them how to handle the problem, he told them how to regain his favor, he told them, if you want me to be among you again, take the accursed thing from among you, cleanse yourself, sanctify yourself, take the evil away, let your time be holy and be clean, I will return. And they did, and God returned. And if we will do the same, the Lord our God is working in our midst, in, the, in, the, in our camp, to deliver us, to deliver the enemy before us. The Bible says, therefore shall your camp be holy. That is, see no unclean thing in thee, and therefore turn away. It is sin and iniquity that can turn God away from us. It is sin and iniquity that can, you know, make us to experience the Savior's chastisement. It is sin and iniquity that can turn victory into defeat. It is sin and iniquity that can turn celebration into a time of sorrow and mourning. And that's what happened for Israel. Joshua told Israel, look, look, at the, look, look at the scriptures. God showed Joshua that the national defeat was as a result of sin. He gave them the problem, he told them how to solve the problem, and he told them how to regain his favor. And if we will fast and pray, there will be revelation where the problem is, how to tackle the problem, and how to regain God's favor. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7. 
We see the same principle there. Here, Israel came to Samuel and they were crying. Look at our situation. How can you be a prophet in the nation? And we are in this mess. Samuel said, the fact that I'm a prophet is not your solution. Let's see the solution. First Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. And the men of Adagiari came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kajajari that the time was long, for it was 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. 20 long years. Why did their problem last for 20 years? Because what they were doing will bring no solution. You, you have experienced a defeat. Blaming your wife will not bring a solution. Fighting with your husband will not bring a solution. Agreeing with your children will not bring a solution. And you can do the wrong things for 20 years and the problem and the defeat stays. That was what happened to Israel. They were doing something, but they were not doing the right thing. And their problem persisted. 20 long years. Verse 3. Verse 2. And it came to pass. Verse 3. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel. No exception. Look at what he said. If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Someone said, the way you are going about, you will remain in bondage. You are serving God, you are serving idol. Syncretism. You worship God on Sunday, you consult the oracle on Monday. You are not going to, you need to abandon sin, abandon idolatry and serve God only. That is the way out of your problem. That is the way into your deliverance. So you, you would know that Israel was doing something, but they were doing the thing that was wrong. Doing something is not what impresses God. Doing the right thing is what moves God. If you are doing something that is not the right thing, you will remain in bondage. You will remain in that defeat. You will remain in that failure for long just like Israel, 20 years. Someone told them, don't deceive yourself. Because they came to him, you are a prophet, pray for us. And someone said, it's not a case of prayer. It's a case of repentance. It's a case of abandoning idol. It's a case of faithfulness to the Lord. It's a case of coming back and serving God only. Then God can respond from heaven. Very important. My brother, maybe you have a challenge. I have been trying to solve that challenge, but be true to yourself. What you are doing is in the right thing. Why are you saying, eh, I've been praying, I've been fasting, and I don't know why this problem persists? My brother, if you do, why the problem persists? You are fasting and praying because there's a problem in the family, but at the back, you go and be gambling and play to potential. You. Do you think God's going to answer your prayer? You are married, you are looking for a child, but you know, you have a double mind. If my wife cannot give me a child, uh, we will get another, uh, we will impregnate another lady outside. What I want is a child. Double minded person. You will not receive anything from God. You say, I'm fasting and praying together with my wife. We are believing God. We believe in God. Your other actions negate your fasting and praying. That's important. Nothing was happen. That was what was happening to Israel. They were worshipping God, but they were worshipping idols. They were going to the temple, and they were going to the tabernacle of God to go and worship, but they were visiting the shrine of idols. And someone said, this way, no deliverance. If you want deliverance, read it again, verse 3. 
And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel. Samuel was a shepherd, prophet, honest, transparent. Don't let me deceive you. He spoke unto all Israel. Say, if ye do return unto the Lord with all your heart, not with some, with all your heart, complete turn around, complete return, complete repentance, and you come back. Then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and oh. serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Verse 4. Then the children of Israel did what they obeyed. If you do as we counsel you, victory is on the way. Mm. If you do as the scripture says, conquest will line you know, your path. Amen. Amen. They did put away Bali and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. Only. Pastor is counseling you every time. This is the way to victory. Where you live, you go and listen to the counsel of all believers. And say, you sit down there. Every and those who are there said, let me give you a thing. You will listen to the rubbish of the unbeliever. Then you will do it. Then you come back. Pastor, since the last time you told me, and I did it so, but it's not working. My brother, it's not working because you are walking the wrong path. You see, someone told them, put away Bali, put away Ashtaroth, put away straight gods, and serve God only. And the Bible says here, they did put away Bali and Ashtaroth, and serve the Lord only. That's fine. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mitzvah, and I will pray for you, for you, you the Lord. Lord. We are learning tonight, if you're a pastor there, you know some people come to us as pastors, they don't mm -hmm. want to repent, but they said, I know you are anointed. Just pray for me. I remember many years ago, there was a lady that came, and then, uh, maybe she will be about 50 or so, she came all the way from Verona to come and see me in Rome. And when she came, that was the first time she said that people recommended for her to come and see me. She said, all right, what's the problem? And then she said, my first boy, 36 year old, he just died suddenly yesterday in a new state. Said, I still spoke to him even yesterday. No sickness, nothing. He just died. I kept quiet for some time. And I want you to pray for me because I don't want this disaster in my life. People said, You are a man. I asked her, Are you involved in prostitution? Do you have girls on the road? Are you receiving blood money? She looked up, she looked down, she said, Pastor, uh, before you, I could not be telling that. Yes, I have a person with you. I told her that this death is, is committed because you are oppressing other people to increase your wealth. And you are trying to use that money to train your children and go, and God is angry. And if you are not careful, what will happen? Then I asked her, Are you ready to release those girls? and let them go and repent of this thing. I will pray for you. She said, that's my life thing you do. I cannot. I came just for you to pray for me. I told her, I told her, my prayer is not like that. I never prayed for her. You know, there's some pastors say, if I don't pray for her now, she will not believe I'm a pastor. Are you the one going to pray, answer the prayer? God will never answer that prayer. You see somewhere here, somewhere told them, repent. Abandon idols. Serve the Lord only. It was when they complied. Someone now said, okay, gather yourself together. I'm going to pray unto God for you. Be a pastor, you know, that uh, because people say, oh, pastor, let's leave that one alone. Just pray for me. No. Be bold. I told them, no. I can't pray. Because God will not answer. I know. Why am I going to waste my survival and my time? 
No, 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 no. You can join us in left. She left. She came all the way from Verona to come and see me in, in Rome. But she left. I'm not going to pray that kind of prayer. Follow the Bible. Can you see here? Israel came for someone to pray for them. And someone said, no, 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 no. It's not prayer for us. It's God that is going to answer the prayer. If your way is not right, there is no need to pray. Go and abandon idols, strange gods, ask that up. Leave them. Serve God only. Prepare your heart. If you do that, then I can pray. And when they did it, he now told them, now that you have, you know, you have complied. Now, gather all these joy together and I will pray for you. I pray that as leaders, God will be keeping us wisdom to know how to deal with people in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't just pray for people because they say they told me you are an anointed man of God. You don't, you don't need you, you don't need their compliment to you are an anointed man of God, whether they say so or not. It's, it's not relevant. It is not their compliment that makes you an anointed man of God. Lord has endowed you. Don't cheap on your anointing. If they will not repent, you don't pray. I remember we had a meeting, a conference in Canada, hot conference. That conference was glorious. And I remember there was a, a, a lady that came, she came from Firenze. I said, Pastor, I thank God for this particular you know, conference. I've been blessed. Okay. But before I go, I want you to pray one prayer for me because that's a big trip that I desire. So I asked her, what exactly it is. I said, before I came to this um, for some time now, there's an Italian man that has been interested in me, but for about one month now, he, he doesn't want to see me. I wanted to pray that God will make my favor and my love to come back to his heart. And you think I will just close my eyes and pray? No, I must ask questions. So I said, tell me more about the man. Is he married? I say, yes, yes, he's married. Does he have children? I say, yes, he has four children. So I asked him, so you want me to pray that this man that is married with four children should abandon his wife, mm -hmm. abandon his children, and then come and love you. I said, my sister, it is an unrighteous desire. I cannot pray for you. If you want to be married, God can bring you a husband that will help you, that will love you, that will do this. You don't have to be happy by breaking somebody else's heart. No. She can be happy and you can be happy. Leave her husband. Pastor, I, just, I know if you just play it, it will be so. I cannot believe it. She left that conference. I never prayed. What prayer am I going to pray? That the Italian man's house should be should be should be destroyed. And that because this is uh, somebody coming to our church, she he should love that one and abandon four children, abandon the wife. What kind of a prayer is that? I never prayed. Just don't just pray any prayer. Pray righteous prayer. Be like Samuel. If they don't repent. No prayer. If they will not abandon sin and follow the pathway of God, no prayer. So after Israel had decided, Samuel said, okay, now gather yourself together. I will pray unto the Lord for you. Verse 6, and they gathered together to misfit and drew water and poured it out before the Lord. Pray told them, prepare your heart. What's preparing their heart? What, is it, what does it mean symbolically to, to, you know, to, 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 to pour water? My brother, when you pour water on the ground, a whole bucket of water, then I tell you, go and gather that water and let the bucket be full again. Is it possible? Yes, no, sir. That's what Israel was saying. Oh God, we are abandoning ourselves unto you. We are just pouring ourselves like water unto you. No gathering, gathering the water anymore. No taking it back. We are yours and yours alone. Consecration. That's what they are doing. They are preparing their heart. They poured water before the Lord and fasted on the day and said, There, we have sinned against the Lord 
as Samuel joined the children of Israel in Mizpe. And when the Philistines found that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpe, the laws of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, a holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel. And the Lord had fasting and prayer done in righteousness, the Lord will hear. And as Samuel was offering up the pot of the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. No mm. weapons. Israel had gone to go out and fast and pray, and the Philistines thought they are without defense. They didn't, they went to go and pray, so they would not take weapons with them. Let's go and overrun them. You are overrunning somebody that is repenting. You want to overrun somebody that is fasting in truth. You, over, you want to overrun somebody because you think he has a defense. There is a God watching from heaven. He will turn down from heaven. You will be wiped out. That's what happened to, to the Philistines. They came with all, their, with all their weapons. God finished them. If our ways are right, God will defend us. Amen. So you could see what happened here. Just like in the case of Israel, these people were in defeat. And someone said, your solution is praying and fasting. Repent, pray. Repent, prepare yourself. Come back to God. There's a solution. And they did. Failure and the Savior's chastisement. So we need to understand that. Samuel told Israel that the way out of their predicament was repenting, fasting, and praying. The question tonight is, are we experiencing defeat in our life or in ministry? Fasting can be a way out of the jungle and the pathway to renewed exploits in the kingdom. The disciples, they tried to cast out an evil spirit and they couldn't. And so I said, this time, Come not out for my prayer and fasting. Have we tried the ministry? We try to do this and do this, and we experience failure. This kind, go not out for my prayer and fasting. Sin will always bring divine chastisement. Psalm 119, verse 67. And we need to understand this. What was the root source of Israel's defeat? Sin. And sin will always, every time, bring divine chastisement. Psalm 119, verse 67. The scripture says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Going astray comes before affliction. Are you being afflicted because you have gone in the path of sin? Are you experiencing defeat because you have put your hand in unrighteousness? Are you experiencing that God has abandoned you because you have gone in the way of compromise? Sin will always bring divine chastisement. In Psalm 107, Psalm 107, Psalm 107, Read verse 17. Psalm 107, verse 17. Fools! Why did they call them fools? Because of their transgression and because of their sin. And afflicted. They are looking for another solution to that affliction. God said, fools. You cannot come out of that affliction this way. You cannot come out of that affliction by banding and losing. Sin is responsible. Repent. You know, some people think that everything is about binding and losing. No, 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 no. There are some problems that repentance and obedience will clear, even without prayer. Fools say because of their transgression and because of their iniquity, 
iniquities in the plural, they are afflicted. That's what happens. It will always bring that. Let me show you something in Leviticus 26, very, very interesting. And it happened with the map of Israel. And they should have known, because God told them that's what he's going to do. When you go into sin, God chastises you a little. He's chastising you a little because he loves you. He wants you to repent. If you don't repent, it will increase the chastisement. Let me show you. In Leviticus chapter 26, look at, look at the scriptures from verse 14. Leviticus 26 from verse 14. It says, but if you will not act unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if he shall despise my status, or if your soul abhor my judgment, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, and consumption, and the burning egg that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. God says, when Israel goes astray, abandons his commandment, in love, he will discipline them and afflict them. To destroy them, no. For them to return so that he can bless them. Look at verse 17. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none persuade you. And if ye will not hear for all this, hearken unto me, then I will punish you how many times? Several times. Sometimes more for your sins. God says, I just give you that small so that you can repent and come back and experience my favor. But God says, if I punish you small, afflict you small in love, and you are obstinate and stubborn, and you continue in sin, said, I will increase it seven times. Do you know what that means? Do you know that Israel experienced that? When you read, our time will not permit us, but when you read the first Samuel chapter four, they went to go and fight the Philistines. In the first battle, they lost 4,000 men. Then they went back to the camp to go and carry the Ark of the Covenant. Then they brought the Ark of the Covenant and everybody was rejoicing. The Ark of the Covenant has come into the camp. It's going to be great. And even the Philistines were afraid. The Philistines said, are you going to give up? No, summon up your courage and fight these Israelites. You know the second time, they lost 30,000 men. Now let me ask you, the first loss was 4,000. Instead of them repenting, they thought that there's another solution. If they bring the Ark of the Covenant, God will deliver. God was looking. You are insane, you, you don't repent. And you are thinking God will still help. You are wasting time. God has told them in us, I will increase it seven times. 4,000 times seven. What do you have? What you have? And God said, let me give you some little jar of God. So he gave them another 2,000 of God. 4,000 times seven is 28,000. Because another 2,000 jar, then they arrived at 30,000. Now, you don't understand God. Sin brings chastisement. But when God chastises you because of your sin, is to make you to return back. Is to make you to abandon sin. Is to make you to return back to God so that He can bless you. But if you continue in that sin, it, the punishment will increase. It will wipe you out. Israel experienced this a, a few times. But God has told them this is God's word. So we should understand that. That sin will always, always, always bring chastisement. I pray that the Lord will cause you, if you ever experience chastisement, to run back to Him in Jesus' name. Amen. So, are you experiencing defeat in ministry? Fasting can be a way out. Sin will always bring divine chastisement. However, fasting can bring restoration of divine favor. What did he say? If my people that are called by my name 
shall humble themselves and repent and, and come out of their evil ways. I will hear from heaven. Repentance, obedience, commit, renewal of your commitment back to God is a way to do truth. I've seen and pray. Now, so we have seen failure and serious chastisement. And sin will bring the serious chastisement. And that will lead to failure. That will lead to defeat. That will lead to, you know, a lot of sorrow or wrath. Now, how can we come up? Fasting and simply consecration. When Israel was defeated, Joshua didn't begin to put the blame on people as this does not solve the problem. My brother, stop blaming people. Eh, my problem is my brother-in-law. Eh, my problem is the pastor. Eh, my problem is this person that didn't help me. Your problem is because of your sin. You need to repent. Putting blame on people will not solve the problem. Putting the blame on your wife does not solve the problem. Putting the blame on your mother does not solve the problem. Putting the blame on your father will not solve your problem. Putting the blame on your on your wife will not solve the problem. You need to, to don't be like Saul. Someone was telling me, I said, he said the people. Some people are always blaming others. Blaming others does not re remove the problem and it will not solve it. So you need to understand that. But in the case of someone, he didn't blame the people that lost the battle. He went to fasting and pray to discover the way out of the defeat. That's what you want. You want a way out of that defeat, out of that failure, out of that quagmire. You want to come out. When David was found out concerning the adultery with Bathsheba, he didn't begin to fight Nathan the prophet. He humbled himself in fasting. We don't have the time, but you can read it there. When, said, when Nathan told him, thou art the man, he could have been fighting. But that doesn't solve the problem. Do you even see in 1 Kings chapter 21? When Elijah confronted him and said, I found you. If you call me your enemy, I'm your enemy. God told Elijah, I will not punish him. Look at him. He's working slowly, he's working on me, and he's fasting. Even a wicked man, very wicked man, when he decided to humble himself to fast, God recognized it. And God told his prophet, let's leave him for now. We will bring the judgment later in his son's days, but not in his days. And God will pay attention to fast. God will pay attention to, you know, to, to pray that is done in righteousness, that you have repented. You are not trying to cover up. Fasting and saintly consecration. You pour yourself out like water poured out, like Israel did. You prepare your heart and you tell God, I'm coming back home. I'm coming back home. Enough of deception. Enough of hypocrisy. Enough of lying. Enough of cheating. Enough of all this uh, double life. Lord, I'm coming home. We know you will be church as a brother. But don't believe us, know what you are capable of doing. You are not a true brother. And God knows, and you know, stop that pretense. Because the problem is not going to be solved. You talk to a pastor, pastor doesn't know, pastor prays for you. Say, I just know that once you pray for me, this problem will be. The problem will remain, my brother, because pastor doesn't answer prayer. It's God that answers prayer. And God knows that you are, you are deceiving yourself. Be true to yourself. Be honest. There's no need to blame anybody. Divine chastisement should drive us to fasting. Humbling ourselves before the Lord in saintly consecration is the way forward. Have you experienced recent defeat? Wait upon the Lord to renew your strength Amen. and mount up with wings as an eagle. Amen. Joshua did. Joshua just stayed before God together with the elders. And if you're experiencing some difficulties in any of our local church, let the pastor and the leaders of that church pray. That will be a solution. In second, in Samuel chapter 21, you see what happened. There was a famine in the nation. They tried to solve the famine, and the famine continued. The Bible says David inquired of the Lord, and God told him, Yes, this famine is not normal. This famine is a, is a punishment for Israel. Because of the atrocities of your former leader, what Saul did. Ah, and, and David said, What are we going to do? 
don't give them a solution, there will be insight. There is a way out. Praying and fasting can do something, and it will in Jesus' name. Amen. Israel showed their consecration by pouring water before the Lord during the time of Samuel. We can do the same. Repent. Come back home. Give your heart fully unto the Lord. We will solve the problems. Number three, fellowship and spiritual cleansing. Acceptable fasting focuses on God. If we are preoccupied with mundane things, business concerns, happy fellowship, happy tears, our fasting will be rejected. You know, Isaiah chapter 58. These people, they wanted a solution and they were fasting. And God didn't even pay attention to the fasting. And they were angry. Why are you angry? Isaiah 58, verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted? Say they, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? And God has said, Behold, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. God says, This is not a fasting unto me. This is a fasting unto yourself. You do what you like. Is that the way to fast? Verse 4 Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the feast of wickedness. You are fasting and say, God, when I finish this fast, let that Mr. A, let him be wiped out. Oh, you are fasting to strive with the feast of wickedness. God says, no, I want people to, to repent. I want them to do A time of fasting is a time for mercy. He says, ye shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on earth. God says, if you want me to pay attention to your fasting, you will not fast this way. It's to tell you that there's a wrong way to fast. Say, the prophet told me, if I fast for seven days, this my problem will disappear. You are fasting for seven days, but you are going to fornicate outside. What fasting is that? Verse 5. Is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush to humble yourself and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen to lose the bands of wickedness and to undo the heavy bodies and to let your breast go free? And that he break every yoke. If you have put people in bondage, release them. You are praying God for mercy. You know what the Bible says? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. During fasting, you are praying for mercy. God says, Who has shown that mercy? The people you put in bondage, let them go. The people you are, you know, wicked towards, stop that wickedness. Show them love. If you want me to show you love. That's important. That's how to fast. Verse 7. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? You know what the Bible is saying? You used to eat three square meals. But now you decided to fast. God said that bread fast that you should have eaten. Give it to somebody that doesn't have food. That lunch that you have eaten, because you are fasting now, Give it to somebody that does not have anything to eat. It's not that you fast from morning to evening. Then in the evening, you say, God, thank you for this fast. You break fast, the lunch and supper, you consume everything together. My brother, that's not fast. You are still eating all your food for the day. God says, that is no fasting. If you have skipped breakfast because you are fasting, give it to somebody that doesn't have food. He will bless me. If you have skipped your Lord because you are fasting, give the Lord to somebody that is going hungry. Because your own going hungry and fasting is by choice. His own going hungry is not by choice. He doesn't have. Show this. That's what God is saying. Deal your food to the hungry. For fasting is a time to show love. Time of fasting is a time to show mercy. Time of fasting is a time of compassion. And God says, you are asking for mercy. You are asking for favor. You are asking for compassion. 
during fasting, first of all, show it. These people were not showing it. And then they said they were fasting. And God said, no, 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 no. If you want me to hear you, you will not fast like they are doing this day. And the same way, not so many people and prophet has told me, if I fast for several days, why are you fasting? Some of those fasting are just useless. I'm not going to achieve anything. People think that fasting is magic. Fasting is not magic. If you do it right, there is a result. If you do it wrong, there are no results. I pray the Lord himself to help us in Jesus' name. Mm. To seek the face of the Lord and to fellowship with him. said, return unto me. Seek his face. It should be, it should also be the time of repentance, forsaking sin, and spiritual cleansing. It is the time to cleanse our hands and purify our hearts so that our voice can be heard on high and God can recognize our fasting. Ethan was stoned to death. We read it. And the nation of Israel was purged because God told them. If you don't take away their cousin pain, if you don't remove that impediment, if you don't cleanse your camp of that perversion and that sin, I will not come. So they have to remove the cousin pain from among them. Israel repented. They cleansed themselves from idolatry. They worshiped before the Lord. And you can see in 1 Samuel chapter 7, God responded. He wiped out the enemy. The people of Nineveh, they repented. They sought the favor of the Lord, humbled themselves before the Almighty God. And you see what happened? God pardoned. Through fasting and prayer, we will always bring results. You want to bounce back from your recent defeat? Fasting is a way. But you've got to be honest. You've got to admit that we are going to wrong. There is no, there is no palliative. You can't be making excuses for what you have done. You know, so some men and God and, and you know, if my wife didn't deny me, I would not have gone to go and be sleeping with other women. My brother, you are not repenting. You are still making excuses. We are not saying that what your wife did is 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 right, but you cannot blame her for your sin. You're going to go and commit immorality outside. It's a personal choice. And it's my wife that, that drove me to it. Then you are not repenting. Then you are not coming out of that, whatever you are in. You need to repent. Didn't you see David in Psalm 51? Have you read in the scriptures? When God gave Israel how to build, God told them if you build a bathroom, you will make sure that the bathroom is covered. So that when you are perfect, nobody will see your nakedness. The bathroom of Uriah and Bathsheba, they were not up to standard. They didn't meet the legal and the building requirement. That was why David, from the top of his house, will see Bathsheba's uh, nakedness. Yes. But you know, David could have been saying, God, if these people obeyed the laws of building that you put in Exodus, I would not have seen uh, Bashifa's nakedness. I would not have been tempted. You are not repenting. David didn't do that. David said, oh God, before you have I sinned, didn't put any blame on Bashifa, didn't put any blame on Uriah, that they didn't build his bathroom very well. Some people, they want, they want God to forgive them, but they want to make progress. They want to bounce back from recent defeat. But instead of acknowledging their sin, instead of admitting their sin, and instead of saying, God, I come, I have no excuse, they, they are making excuses. And then they say they are praying. Useless prayer. They say they are fasting. Useless fasting. You've got to acknowledge, repent, come back to God, prepare your heart, consecrate yourself, be honest before God. That's the only way. Very practical about this. Victory can come. What do we find there? Fruits of spiritual conquest. Following the fasting of Joshua and Israel, Israel experienced a new victory. I think we have read it. Uh, in Joshua chapter 8, God, I mean, God eventually gave them a new resounding victory over here. They wiped out the hand completely. Remember the case of Joshua? They fasted, they prayed. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, God told them, tomorrow, Take singer, 
go to the one for victory is yours. They want the victory. You remember the case of Esther? I will fast. You go and fast for me, and I will go to the king. If I perish, I perish. He will not perish. He will live. He will not perish. He will survive. He will not perish. He will try. Because praying and fasting will bring victory. You remember the case of Ezra? They prayed, and the Bible says God was treated of them. God protected them. Praying and fasting brings results. That's important. Israel enjoyed the fruit of a mighty conquest over the enemy. Israel I mean, received a mighty help from the Lord against the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 7. The Navy experienced divine pardon and the sentencing of judgment that was hanging over them was cancelled. Cancelled. So, read that in Jonah chapter 3. Scriptural fasting will bring about healing. It will bring about divine protection, divine visitation, divine insight, divine revelation. You see all those there. Daniel prayed and fasted. You know, we could have, we could have titled this message praying and fasting, but praying and fasting in the right way. Not going to pray and fast and sing, like Isaiah chapter 58. That praying and fasting is useless. But first of all, you repent. First of all, you consecrate yourself. First of all, you prepare your heart. First of all, you, you humble yourself before God. You acknowledge your sin. You talk back from sin. You forsake sin. Then you fast and pray. That prayer and fasting, God will respond to it. And it's many, many times the way to bounce back from recent defeat. What is that defeat or setback have you experienced in the family? Praying and fasting will be a way out of that. What kind of defeat or setback or failure have you experienced personally? Have you experienced physical failure? Have you experienced moral failure? Have you experienced some spiritual defeat? Everything, nothing is working. Check yourself. If you are still in the Lord, repent. If you have gone astray or compromised, if you have put your hand in any form of unrighteousness, come out of it. Come out from among them and be separate. That's the only time God can receive you as a son, as a daughter. And then give yourself to fasting and praying and see what God will do for you. Bouncing back from recent defeat. This works for an individual. This will work for a family. This will work for a local church. This will work for a community. This will work for a nation like Nineveh, the Ninevites. It will work. Whether individual or corporate, it will work. Bouncing back from recent defeat. Can I ask you tonight, what recent defeat have you faced? What recent failure is burdening your life? What affliction and the, you know, a lot of disappointment is coming over your life? You can bounce back from those recent defeat. You can bounce back from those recent failure. The Lord can give you the victory, especially if it has been because of sin or righteousness, compromise, disobedience, rebellion, in one way or the other. And God's favor has left your life. And God's mercy has abandoned you. If you will return back unto God, if you will repent, if you forsake every form of idolatry, the idols of our time, the idol of fashion, the idol of money, the idol of this or that, if you will forsake all those idols and serve the Lord only and consecrate yourself unto him, he will hear you. And Amen. Back from that defeat. As Amen. Israel bounced back, Joshua chapter 7, they experienced a mighty defeat. For Joshua chapter 8, they bounced back from that recent defeat. First Samuel chapter 7, they've been suffering defeat for 20 years. But when they repented and departed and they came back, they experienced a mighty victory. In Second Chronicles chapter 20, they fasted and prayed, fear went out of the window, God accepted, he gave them the victory. In Ezra chapter 8, they fasted and they prayed, they got what they wanted. Esther prayed and fasted, the whole nation was spared. That's why the difference was implemented. My brethren, tonight also, are you here? Recent defeat, recent setback, recent failure, 
you can bounce back from that. Don't do the way. Repentance, consecrating yourself, preparing your heart, humbling yourself before God, praying and fasting, you will come out. If Amen. That call by my name will humble themselves and, you know, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from them. Let's rise up and pray. And tell the Lord and say, oh God, I want to bounce back from every defeat. No, 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 I want to bounce no, no. back from every disappointment. I want to bounce back from every every failure. I want to bounce back, Lord. I want to bounce back from set passes. I want to bounce back. You can bounce back, my brother. You can bounce back, my sister. That family can bounce back. You can bounce back. You can bounce back. You don't want to help you. You can bounce back from defeat. You can bounce back from failure. You can bounce back from setback. You can bounce back from disappointment. This is God's purpose for you. Bouncing back from recent defeat. Bouncing back from recent defeat. Bouncing back from recent defeat. If you have gone into sin and compromise and you want to bounce back from your affliction and your oppression, repentance is the first thing. The repentance is the first thing. You cannot pass the string and compromise and expect God to answer. He will not. If anybody tells you God will, they are just they are just telling two lies. The only way, the way forward, is the way of righteousness. The way forward is the way of holiness. The principle in the scripture is what we are just Just chapter seven, there was a defeat. Just chapter eight, they passed out from that defeat. But how did they do it? I'm just showing you. They humble themselves, they break, they pass them, they dealt with sin, and they make sure that every single thing was gone. Is there any compromise in your life? You need to deal with sin. 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 And God is calling you tonight. Be honest before God. You are not praying to any man, you are praying to God. Be honest before God. I say, God, before you, I'm open. Before you, you are the only one that before whom I have to do. But let me go tonight. Let me come to your rescue. Very important, my brother. Very important, my sister. Bouncing back from recent defeat. Bouncing back from recent defeat. Don't blame anybody for your for your defeat. Don't blame anybody for your yeah, sin. Back, it's important. To the name of the Lord, sir. Are you experiencing, you know, part of results in ministry? My brother, are you implementing ministry? Are there compromises in your methods? And that's why God has abandoned you. You say you're a pastor. You say you're a prophet. You say you're an apostle. But we cannot see the signs of an apostle yeah, in your life. Yeah. Have you put your hand yeah. in sin? Are you living a life of compromise? God yeah. will not do anything. Uh, Repent tonight and come back to God. Jesus. And come back to God with consecration. Come back to Him with fasting. Come back to Him in humility. Prepare your heart. Pour out your life unto Him as water is poured out. And Never gathered back. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these lessons. And we're going to be learning from this Joshua chapter 7, chapter 8. Many, many, many lessons to pull out that can undergird our victorious living on this side of heaven. Oh Lord, as you are showing us, help us to be imprinting these principles upon our heart, and when the time comes, to be implementing them so that we can experience victory in Jesus' name. Amen. So that many as are experiencing the people on the platform tonight, they are going to sit down, going to look at their lives, acknowledge their sin before God. Acknowledge their compromise and backslid, backsliding before God. Return back to God. The Bible tells us in Hosea chapter 6, if, 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 we, if we call back unto the Lord, he will heal us. He will help us. Very, very important. And after three days, he will revive us. And we shall live in his life. Oh God, I pray 
as they humble themselves in prayer, as they repent, as they come back to you, preparing their heart, consecrating their life, and then spending some time in praying and fasting. Oh God, let their strength be renewed. Let their way be clear. Amen. Oh God, everything that has blocked them, blocked their life, let those things be blown away like cloud is blown away. Amen. Amen. Give them conquest in every Amen. area. God, make your face to shine upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God that when we do things right, you, you visit us. When you did, we do things right, insight and enablement and empowerment comes from heaven. And let it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Let it bounce back from any recent defeat in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you because we know you have answered. Thank you, Jesus. Just mighty and victorious name, we pray. Amen. Amen.